Birds. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It is brought to you by PropSwap. Where America buys and sells sports bets. Go to PropSwap.com. Download the PropSwap app today. Mike Gill. Andrew DeCecco at a DeCecco NFL from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast, of course, powers this football at four. And there's a lot going on. As yesterday we told you, and as everybody knows, Devonta Smith is out. We'll get Andrew's perspective on what that means moving forward for the wide receiver and the wide receiver room. But how about the guy throwing the football to Devonta Smith and the rest of the wide receivers here. I want to get Andrew's take on what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the first couple of uh, days at Eagles training camp. And I thought yesterday, Andrew, Shane Steichen, the new offensive coordinator, uh, he said something that's got to make Eagle fans pretty happy about the quarterback, Jalen Hurts, and his performance so far at training camp. Uh, what are you hearing and seeing about Hurts so far early on in camp? You knew we had... Well, we knew that Jalen Hurts had the poise. We knew that he had the leadership and 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 on and the work ethic and everything like that. But what you're seeing now is someone who likes to be coached hard. And now he has a number of different coaches that are in his ear every single day of practice, working on different deficiencies or areas of improvement in his game. And he welcomes that. You don't see a lot of young players that, that are that are willing to accept the coaching and 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 want to be uh, essentially want to be perfect. You know, that's not obviously, and it's not going to happen in one off season, but he's really, I mean, right now they're focusing on footwork and Nick Sirianni's mentioned that. And, and that's something that Jalen obviously really needed to work on when he saw that his feet were sort of all over the place last, uh, in his, in his limited time out there last season. And, and, and it's sort of equated to inaccurate passes. And he was very quick to el- elude the pocket and, pick up yards with his legs, but I think getting, having, getting a setting his base and things like that and, and, and being able to have that sturdy launch point, I think that's really going to help him moving forward. And he's just, you know, for a young player, a 22 year old kid to be just open to as much coaching as he can get and absorbing it. I mean, that's very, uh, it speaks volumes. Now Shane Steichen, the new offensive coordinator, he said something yesterday, Andrew, that really stood out to me. And he talked a lot about, Uh, or he went in and zoned in on one thing about Hurts that he really likes. And I'm not sure that a lot of people uh, got a chance to see a lot of that this last year because obviously they didn't have the weapons to do it. But Shane Steichen said his ability uh, to throw the deep ball and hit guys in stride, uh, that that is something that has really impressed him with how he throws the deep ball right now. So a little bit about what that could add to this offense if you have a quarterback who can take more shots down the field because we know that that was not something uh, the accuracy of Wentz down the field was was an issue, even when he was at his best sometimes. Yeah, well, adding uh, adding the deep ball to the offense is going to add another dimension, another wrinkle to the offense that teams really – the Eagles really haven't had that sort of uh, dimension to work with, and they've had a lot of receivers that – didn't have that top end speed and they had to do a lot of the short to intermediate routes and didn't quite work out with Jalen Rager last season, who many expected to fulfill that role. They've tried it with Bryce Treggs and a number of other players, but now they have uh, a young nucleus of receivers and a quarterback who's uh, equipped to fire the ball downfield with accuracy. And, and, and I I think that there's a lot of question about Jalen's velocity, but I think that we're really going to see, what he's able to do. And I think that he's working on his accuracy and that stems from his footwork. And he does have the arm strength to get the ball down there. And now he has uh, a number of receivers that can get open down the field and make those type of plays. And I think now the coaching staff is sort of going to integrate that into the offense. And last season you saw an offense that was largely unimaginative and uncreative. And and now you're going to see, you know, and more and more innovative offense, and I think that's going to be a big part of it. Yeah, one of the things Steichen said was uh, his ability to throw the deep ball, hit guys in stride. That's an 80-yard touchdown of a, instead of a 60-yard gain. How many times did we see an underthrown ball uh, that could have been a much bigger play? Uh, the question I guess I would have for you, Andrew, is: Do the Eagles have the weapons for the 80-yard touchdown? Huh. 
Well, it's funny. Before that, the the one play that really sticks out to me that it, that could have been a touchdown was that underthrown pass to Dallas Goddard from Carson Wentz in the Green Bay game. That's a classic example uh, of a play that should have been yeah, a much larger get pick up on the play or could have even gone for a score. So uh, I, I think that having a new quarterback under center that can is more proficient in that area, I think you're going to see that the benefits, the offense is going to really reap the benefits there. But um, as far as do they have the personnel for it, I think that Jalen Rager, I, I've said that on, on your show, that I think he's going to take a, a – enormous leap in his second season and fulfill the role that they drafted him to do, which is to be that dynamic presence, that explosive weapon that can do a number of different things. I think he's going to be the vertical threat. You also have guys that are vying for that final job in John Hightower and Quez Watkins and Devontae Smith uh, knows how to get deep. I mean, he, he, a lot of uh, many have billed him as that intermediate guy and that very well may be his role, but he he's shown that he can separate down the field and, and sort of create yards after the after the catch as well. So they have those guys. They have a number of guys there. And Dallas Goddard's a tight end who can get vertical as well. So they, they're going to have a lot more of a explosive element to their offense this season. Hey, I want to get your take on something that Hertz said as well, and, and you kind of touched on. But he mentioned that he prefers to be coached hard and prided himself on being coachable. I don't want to say he's taking a shot at Peterson, but. You know, Adam has been on the show and said he thought one of the things that Peterson did not do a good job on was developing younger players. You know, they won with a veteran team, but when that team started to move on and they had younger players, we have been critical of Howie Roseman's drafts is Hertz kind of mentioning that, hey, these guys are coaching me hard and I like it and that that is something that should help the rest of this team. Yeah, if you read between the lines, I mean, that that sort of indicates your you know your point. That's a very valid point because if you look at the roster, a lot of the young players, there isn't a lot of uh, of young blue chip talent that you really saw take the next step. And I think that stems from just the the, the lack of development. And like you said, they have when they've won, it's been with a veteran nucleus. And in in order for for sustained success, you have to develop your young players. And I think now you're going to see. Uh, and that's one of the things that Nick Sirianni has, has sort of preached and, and driven, that, driven home that point that he's all about com- uh, competition, development, and putting players in the best position to be successful. And I think now you're going to see a lot of these young players take a leap forward because now they're going to be put in, in those positions to be successful, like your Jalen Ragers, like those young receivers that I talked about, possibly even J.J. Ortega Whiteside. I still think that this is the last, you know, it's a last ditch effort, but I think that. They're, this coaching staff, if they're going to be able to sort of find something that he can that he can do, how he can help the team, they're going to. And um, they have a number of young offensive linemen to work with. And they, they've they always developed because they were thrust in. They had to. And you know, now you know what you have there. And I think Jalen Hurts is going to be probably one of the biggest beneficiaries of having a hands-on coaching staff that, that, that prides himself on, um, you know, just – Taking, taking the players' best traits and, and you know, utilizing that. Uh, yesterday, obviously, the news with Devonta Smith expected to miss two to three weeks, sprained MCL. So who gets an opportunity now to kind of step in and take advantage of some more repetitions that could possibly help this team down the road? Well, obviously, Jalen Rager, is, he's the clear answer. But, I mean, he's a starter, so I'm not really considering him. I, when I look at guys who are going to benefit – from Devontae Smith's absence is going to be players that are further down the depth chart, like a John Hightower or a Quez Watkins, that ordinarily wouldn't have gotten those type of those those kind of the volume, those kind of reps um, with a with a fully stocked receiving core. And you know, going into the preseason, there's only three preseason games, so these are the guys that really need these reps as they look to either audition for the Eagles and make a final roster push or get some film on there for other teams to look at. And I think that John Hightower is a raw player. They're both raw players, but they both have different traits that are enticing to teams. And I think when you look at what John Hightower can bring, he doesn't get, uh, he gets open with regularity, but he struggled to track the football and a lot of things that you see from, from players who are, are raw and sort of thrust in there when they're not necessarily ready to do so. The Eagles didn't have a whole lot of options. And then Quez Watkins is another player who, You'd like to see him get a little bit stronger, but he's such an explosive, speedy guy, quick twitch guy, um, knows how to can, can separate as well, and I think he's going to be a, a dynamic presence there, and he's really opened some eyes in training camp. So those are two guys right there 
that I look to make uh, that I think will make the best use of these increased snaps. There's uh, two stories that I think are interesting, Andrew. I want to get your kind of perspective on one. Uh, they're both basically because of injury. Uh, one is Davion Taylor and what he's doing at linebacker. All of a sudden, I mean, he was a guy that mm-hmm. we were scratching our head, wondering where he fit. Well, all of a sudden, Alex Singleton is out because of COVID. Taylor's in. And what are we hearing about what kind of role he could have? Uh, because I, don't, I think each of us kind of were wondering whether or not he would ever be a regular uh, contributor to the defensive side of the ball. Well, you always have to take these training camp, you know, little nuggets. This player is breaking out. This player looks great. But you always want to take that with a grain of salt because many times that ne- doesn't necessarily translate into the regular season. Yes, it's encouraging to see that. And he has been one of the bright spots this summer or, you know, in the early goings. And, you know, as far as what his role is going to be, I don't, I think that still has yet to be determined. I mean, he still has a long way to go to unseat an Alex Singleton or even cut into his snaps. But I think that he's starting to show – that maybe he isn't as far behind or isn't as much of a project as we may have been led to believe. Do I think he's going to step right in there and become a starter and and an all pro? No, I think it's going to be more of a gradual transition, but I do think you're going to see him carve out a role for himself. And I think that you're going to see the coaching staff look to find ways to exploit his athleticism and get him on some of these quick twitch guys, shifty guys, and, and kind of have him cover them up and, um, just take advantage of, of, of his lateral quickness and, and just fluidity. I think that he has a lot to offer, and now it's just finding an, a niche for him and, and, and putting him in position to be successful. Yeah, I think that's something to definitely watch, as you kind of mentioned. And then the other one uh, would be, not because of injury, uh, but Josh Sweat and uh, Derek Barnett and what's going on over yeah. there and how that could really change the outlook of this defensive line. Yeah, you know, going into training camp, that's not necessarily a roster battle that many had circled or anything like that. But, you know, like I like I said before, this really rings true to, you know, I, I hearken back to what Nick Sirianni said in his opening press conference and how he was going to, you know, really promote competition and throughout the roster. He didn't limit it to any specific position. It's throughout the roster. And um, Josh Sweat, and I've said this before, even last year on your show, He's the team's best pure pass rusher. That's very evident. Now, Derek Barnett is a more strikes me as more of an every down player, but he doesn't give you that flash, that 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 burst. I don't know that he'll ever be a double digit sack guy. Um, Josh Sweat strikes me as someone who comes off the bench in a, in a relief role and and provides more of a burst. He's he's very athletic, long arms, good bend. He has everything you look for. Now it's now it's comes to the point where they have to look at and see if he can. Uh, if he can be an every down defensive end and maybe you make Derek Barnett have to have to come off in a rotational role. Um, I, I think that Josh Sweat is a starting caliber defensive end. And I think that he gives the Eagles the best pairing opposite Brandon Graham. But, you know, up until training camp, you never, I don't know that that was ever even up for consideration. I don't think that was ever really talked about, but now you're starting to see, Hey, you know what? That's going to create a lot of a, a lot of advantages for the defense. If you get this guy with these long arms, get his arms up there, his quickness, his flexibility, um, and, and get him out there to pair with Brandon Graham and and your two defensive tackles and Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave. I mean, that's that's a that's a fearsome four right there. Yep, I like uh, I like what we're hearing about Josh Sweat, and I like the way you broke it down, Andrew Dechecko, football at four. Uh, a lot of interesting kind of things emerging. What are you hearing about Zach McPherson? Uh, and obviously the fact now that they don't have to push him into a starting role because of Steven Nelson. Uh, but uh, I've heard some really good things about him up there as well. Yeah, and, and, and that's very, again, that's very encouraging because, like, I, like I've said before, the cornerback position, transitioning from college corner to NFL corner, that's one of the hardest positions to get acclimated to. And now it's he's able to sort of gradually – find his footing, if that makes sense, because he's not being forged by fire, knowing that there's no one else there. It's like, hey, you know what, man, you might have to be starting in week one. And, and now I think he's able to really really learn and not really feel a whole lot of pressure and just go out there and play football. And he's a tough, scrappy player, play physical, match out with these receivers. And you know what? You're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but you get to, you get to take to the coaching and, and without the pressure of, you know, I got to get this right. You know, there's only X amount of weeks until the regular season and I might be starting whatever. I think now he's able to really take a deep breath, 
play football and and learn at, learn as he goes. Uh, the other uh, battle, which uh, apparently isn't becoming much of a battle, is at left tackle, and obviously mm-hmm. Dillard is uh, having you know uh, a rough time it seems. Whereas Jordan Mailata seems to really be grabbing a hold of that position. Is that what you're hearing as well? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm hearing. And it's funny because when Andre Doer was coming out of college, he was billed for his footwork. He was billed as a uh, uh, really standout in pass protection tackle with good, with nifty footwork, his athleticism, this and that. And if there was a knock on him, it was more so that he didn't have that grit, that nastiness, didn't play with the main streak in the running game. Um, when you look at Jordan Mailata, Jordan Mailata came into the NFL as a, you know, he's never played the game of football before, you know, prior to being drafted in 2018. And look how far he's come. And I think that's a testament to um, Jeff Stout. And I also think that's a testament to what the work that Jordan Mailata has put in to becoming uh, a starting left tackle. And that's really what he's become. I mean, I don't know that it's even a competition anymore. Um, he's just, he, he Every, everything, Andre Doer, there's not one thing that he can do better than what Jordan Mailata can do right now. Jordan Mailata is, is a freakish athlete. Yep. He's bigger, he's stronger, and he's more proficient um, in, in, against the uh, in, in pass pro and, and in, in run blocking. There's not anything that Andre Doer does right now that's better that would even warrant um, consideration to be a starter right now. It's, and it's early, but, I mean, it's not very encouraging if you're uh, – Andre Doerr. No, dude, I, I, I totally agree. And, and I said this uh, a while back about Mylotta. He almost is like, you know, finding Joel Embiid. You know, now Joel Embiid was the third pick in the draft, but just like nobody else has the size, strength, and skill set that Embiid has. And and Mylotta is almost this, this guy's six foot eight, probably like 400 pounds almost. For him to have the ability to move the way he does, it's like they uncovered this unicorn. You know what I mean? Like, they just completely mm-hmm. found this unicorn. So, for all the hits that Howie Roseman takes, for him to find this guy is almost unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, 6'8", 340, very, very light on his feet, remarkably strong, uh, can get to the second level with, with relative ease. He's just, you know, he's just a freakish athlete, and you don't really stumble on those guys in the seventh round. I mean, when you draft in the seventh round, as you know, Mike, you're drafting on traits and upside, and, you know, it's almost like a shot in the dark. And they, they, they saw this guy with all these with all these uh, with these with traits and these certain uh, abilities, and they figure, let's get him in there, and let's see if we can mold him into being, a, you know, a, a steady backup. I don't know if they ever imagined that he would – surge up the depth chart and become a, a starting left tackle. So, I mean, you got you to gotta, you gotta give it to Howie Roseman on that. Uh, I don't know that you – did you see uh, – NBC Philadelphia did the whole uh, mic'd up the other night on the coaching staff. Did you see any of that? I did not. All right. Well, uh, it, it seems that they have a very young, energetic, and very, you know, hands-on coaching staff. And it just seems like it's a total different – camp than what they've had the last couple of years. This isn't like, hey, Peterson was terrible, but it is definitely a different vibe up there, it seems, than they've had in the past. And you wonder, you know, how much that will carry over into the performance on the field. I don't know, uh, but I definitely love the vibe of, that this coaching staff is giving. Well, that youthful exuberance can only get you so far. I mean, it, it's certainly a – it's going to reinvigorate the the team and that's really what they needed. I think it was getting a little stale. I think the message was becoming stagnant. So then you, you bring all these, you know, fresh faced coaches in there and they have their different beliefs and, and ideologies. And, and I think that um, it's really starting to uh, just it's starting to radiate to the roster. Right. I think that you're seeing uh, the energy come through the hands-on coaching and it, it just becomes, um, infectious really because it, then you start to see coaches who are believing in the players believing in what they're doing and uh, and coaching them hard and they're starting to see results and you know it, it's encouraging but you know you get a couple losses under your belt and, and that stuff kind of goes out the window so they just got to keep that keep that energy and that youthful exuberance and it's going to start to you know really rebuild the culture that was really uh it was really damaged and fractured um you know when you know in ja- only only in january so it's encouraging. No doubt. Uh, Andrew DeCecco, Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. A. DeCecco NFL. Give him a follow over there. 
And, of course, uh, he's back on Friday. We'll have plenty more on training camp. And then uh, we will be less than a week away from the start of the preseason and how they're going to approach the three preseason games instead of four. Will we see more? Will we see less? Uh, we'll get a better feel on that as we get closer. Jeff's here tomorrow. Adam on Thursday. Andrew's back on Friday. Andrew Decheco, everybody. Thanks, pal. You got it. Have a good one.